open up for questions, and Greg has the answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brother Greg has done a great job tonight and for decades. He has practiced what he has preached here tonight and has helped stabilize many, many uh, Christian families, Christian couples. Now, everybody doesn't raise your hand at one time. Or at all. Or at all. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much, brother. That was a fantastic presentation. I can speak for myself. I really appreciate it. Um, I believe that there's a stigma, if you will. I think it's getting better overall in our current culture, but I believe it's still there when we talk about therapy sessions or uh, premarital counseling or reaching out, communicating, and talking about problems and trying to fix ourselves. So. Um, what might you say to someone who's trying to overcome those type of stigmas and really wants to improve themselves? Well, there's two choices. I'm sure there's more than that. The one choice is to tell everybody what you're doing. The other choice is to keep it secret. There are many individuals who discreetly find a doctor and find someone that they believe they can work with and they may or may not be also working with a leader in their congregation or with a gospel preacher, and then they quietly do their best to heal themselves with that help and with God's blessing. So that the other choice is to just let the world know, like, hey, I got these problems. I'm on these meds, and and uh, if I act a little crazy today, it's because we're changing the dosage. I don't know how it's going to work. And some people are that open with who they are. Most people are not. It takes a lot of courage to say, here I am, warts and all. And we're not used to that degree of openness in most of our relationships. So when somebody says, hey, I've got, they're like, oh, 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 okay, let me, let me back up over here and treat you like somehow you are deficient mentally. See, there's a big difference in being unable mentally and having issues emotionally. Either one requires special love on our part. And so I'm, I'm firmly convinced, and I use this illustration all the time, if you break an arm, what are you going to do? Because I ask people, well, so, so you seem to have the characteristics of these emotional difficulties, whether or not you have an official diagnosis of those of us who aren't doctors, we can't diagnose anything, but says it, it appears that you have the symptoms of these things. Um, what, what are you doing about it? Well, my preacher just told me to pray more. I'm like, well, okay, it's always good to pray. We're to pray without ceasing. Has that solved your problem? No. So I'm not praying enough. Okay, well, keep praying, but what can we add to your list? And so sometimes when we only seek a spiritual solution, for something that has another solution that could go along with that spiritual solution, I, I think that's the wise course. So the broken arm needs a broken arm doctor. Emotional issues need someone that can help us with emotional issues. And we can keep that as, as silent as we want. I will say though that those who look upon others disdainfully, those who look down on anyone, Whoever gets help for a situation of emotional difficulty, that that is that is so short-sighted, because we never know what tomorrow is going to bring in our own lives, and we never know. But we need the help and support, and love of every one of our brothers and sisters, and we don't need somebody looking down their nose because we've reached out for help in a way they never had, and that's what often happens. I told you, you have a good answer. <laughs> Very good uh, lesson. Very appreciate it. I might just encourage uh, those that are here tonight to take a step back even prior to preparing for marriage and say just preparing for life. Um, I've been married 39 years and probably sure similar stories that you and Cassie could share too. 
Um, but uh, one of the things that Vicki and I learned three or four years into marriage, because a lot of our contemporaries that got married about the same time, some got divorces and several of them were just miserable. And, you know, when we would visit with them and, and maybe would come to us for counseling, and we had talk and there was a commonality of the problems and issues like you enumerated on tonight. Yeah. But we wondered why, uh, you know, we got through some of those things that, that others didn't and others still struggled with. And we actually went to a, uh, a long, several months seminar on communication skills yeah. because we didn't really know how to articulate and put into a teaching format to others what we were doing mm -hmm. because we just kind of uh, fortunately uh, you know, looked at the scriptures and did what we thought was right and agreed to agree upon what the Lord wanted us to do. But we learned a lot, and it was important to learn those communication skills. And to me, that precedes even preparing for marriage. That's, that's a preparation for all relationships. And the things that, that we learned in learning to communicate well helped us as parents and also helped us in our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that's the first thing that I always start with if I'm counseling uh, a couple or even an individual or young people is starting with those communication skills because if we don't learn to communicate properly you're going to have problems in all kinds of areas but if you can master those communication skills and how to I think the instructors we had called it fight fairly I don't like putting it on those terms because of say fight but that's really where it learns to communicate respectfully with another person, it will alleviate a lot of these things because everyone will face these same issues in their marriage or in their parenting with their kids or even in relationships in a congregation with other individuals. So thank you for your thoughts tonight. Very good. So what I, what I hear from that is preparation and a willingness to take time and courses like that are usually not free. A willingness to take the time and put in the effort to learn to the glory of God. Now we always start with the scriptures. Everything we do, everything we learn, we compare to what we know from the scriptures. The only book that we will ever read that is inspired is the Word of God. Any book written by anyone after that is not. They're going to do the best they can, but they're not inspired. What I have in the front are just some books I pulled out of my family section on how to counsel others. And a couple of those are from H. Norman Wright, who's the co-author of the workbook that I've used in premarital studies. They are, he's just one author among many. There are many individuals who've said, if you're going to do counseling of any kind with individuals that you care for, here are some tools. And that's all it is, here are some tools. And if I came to your house and said, I want you to change the oil in my car, and you just slid under the car with your bare hands, I'd say, where's your tools? And you say, oh, I, it'll take me a while, but I'll, I'll be able to do this. It's like, well, I think this was a mistake, you know. So if we're going to do things like this, and we need to, we need to, we need tools. And we need appropriate tools. And we always have to start with God. We start with what's true, and we add to that so that we can then say, you know, on the subject of communication, here's some things we can do. Here's some exercises. Here's some assignments. Here's some things to list. Here's some things to be thankful for. And let's concentrate on good things this week that we can communicate about. Because some couples think the stony silence of a marriage is somehow a good marriage. It's like, sorry, that just means you've not yet figured out how to work through who we are. And all of us who are married have those issues. Cassie's had to put up with so much through the years, and it's a, it's a long list. I do well remember, uh, to me it's humorous, when we first married, she thought she had to get up and fix breakfast every morning. I thought I had to get up and eat it. 
after a little while, I told her, you know, I, I don't usually eat breakfast. She said, well, I don't usually get up to fix it either. I'm like, well, we, we, we had a communication and an agreement. And it, it worked out well for us. So anything like that is the merging of two individuals into a one flesh relationship. And many of those things are absolutely harmless, but they can be like a little pebble if they are an irritant that's not handled appropriately. They can be a little pebble that we say, oh, that's not that big of a deal, and we throw it into a sack. We can carry that sack, it just has a few pebbles. And after a few years, that sack is so heavy, we can't carry it anymore. And then we wonder why relationships in the Lord's church fall apart. It's because, as, as the good book says, little foxes spoil the vines. And so little things can overwhelm our relationships. Brother Alan Bonifay. Good job, Greg, as always. Thank you. Uh, I think a lot of times preachers who are well into their preaching time, I'm not talking about young men uh, just starting out, but someone was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years under their belt as a preacher, uh, they want to help in situations like this, but they don't know how, and they're further intimidated by uh, their own problems, like the one you just recounted. Yeah. And uh, so they just kind of don't know what to say. Uh, but I remember, uh, I don't, I don't know the situation, but something came up in California, and I needed some instruction about all of this. And in four or five sessions with you, I was able to use that same workbook and talk with a number of couples through the years. And I don't claim to be very good at this, but I can do a little first aid and point people to some greater authorities if necessary. And there are a few people around like you who can help others learn to do this kind of thing. And I think it's something that's going to become more and more important for our uh, seasoned preachers to, to learn to, to get and use the material that will enable them to help young people prepare for marriages and keep their marriages uh, solid and strong and growing for the future of the church. I know you're not sitting around twiddling your thumbs looking for something to do. No. But anyway. <laughs> Well, there, there are more people helping today than ever before, and I am so thrilled. There are individuals who are making a point to say, I want some education in this area, and that is wonderful. And there are individuals in this part of the country, there are individuals in the West, individuals in the South, there are individuals who are willing to help and are educated in these areas. Some of us have just been willing to help and we do the best we can. But I'm just saying all of us need to be willing to share the burden. That's who we are. We, we bear one another's burdens, don't we? And so when a, when a relationship is, is in trouble, um, we need to love enough to say, let's talk, let's talk. And we need to love enough to say, I'm going to sort out what I can and see what scriptural principles can apply to this situation so we can start a recovery. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you look somebody that's married in the eye and you say, tell me one thing that you're thankful for in the person you're married to. Tell me one thing. And sometimes individuals have said, I don't have an answer for you. I don't have an answer for you. Like, okay, that's your assignment for the week. I want this to plague you in the night <laughs> until you come up with, with an appropriate answer. Give me one thing that you're thankful for in this person you're married to. Because until you find some point of positivity, you're never going to help heal that relationship. You just can't. Because we can hide behind our hurt. And oh, we can hurt one another. We can hide behind that. And if we're not careful, we will use the hurts in our life as a shield 
to prevent us from ever really committing to a relationship the way we should. It takes a lot of courage to work through problems in a marriage, but it's God's will that we do that. Brother Glenn Oscar, I really appreciate it, Greg. That's good. Uh, Edgar Rich's book, Love and Respect, I think is a, Thank you. Yes. Love, love and Respect is, a, is to me a gem out yeah. of the lunch that we've read. Uh -huh. And uh, I've often said to couples, Philippians 4 8 is the most disobeyed verse in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Adam, you know, think on what sort of things are good. Yeah. But uh, I see you have several stands that are, I recommend love and respect. What, what, do you have certain gems that you, uh, for premarital, do you, do you have certain things that you recommend? Ed Wheats, before you say I do, is that? Well, my, my curriculum has changed through the years. Um, long, long, long ago, there was a stack of extra reading assignments about two feet tall where I had marked chapters and multiple pages that the lucky or unlucky couple had to read and report on every time they came together. And so I had a whole collection of books that I had extra assignments. Through the years that has changed. I still recommend uh, Dave Ramsey's Anything on Financial Management, but there are other authors besides him. I still recommend uh, the work Finding the Love of Your Life. Um, and I still recommend Larry Christensen, The Christian Family. Um, there's a whole host, Love and Respect. Um, there's a whole host of books, dozens of them, that I've read and recommended through the years. The, the workbook that I use is by H. Norman Wright. And anything that he has ever written has always resonated with me. It's always been something that I appreciated and, and, and thought I could understand to share. But my first initial foray into all of this was because somebody was in trouble and I didn't want them to quit the church. I didn't want them to leave their spouse. I didn't want them to quit the church. And I refused to let go. Now that may not have been the appropriate thing, but I said, no, we're going to talk. Now I had no idea what to do, but I just knew I cared, and that's where I started. I found in the area a, a preacher with the Christian church who was putting on a seminar on how to do counseling for troubled marriages. He had been to some training and he put on a seminar, and several of us went to that. Now. The, the basic components of that are in any book on marriage relationship and repairing relationships. But I want to share with you briefly what he shared long ago. What he shared was, when you start helping other people in their lives, they are extremely vulnerable. They are very, very vulnerable. And if you help them, they will turn to you with affection and they will turn to you with dependence. And if you're not careful, you will make mistakes. And that Christian preacher from long, long ago looked us all in the eye in the audience that had come for his training and he said, when I first started years ago, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. And he said, I'm telling you this because I don't want you to ever make that mistake. When I say to a preacher, to a church leader, how is your marriage? <coughs> how are you at controlling your own passions? What does your wife think about you helping others? That's what I have in mind whenever I say things like that. Because we do not want to add sin to sin we do not want our helping others to end up in a guilty conscience for ourselves. And so there are many, many books that can help, and I've read a lot of them about many various situations. And come to the house one of these days, the family section lives in the garage. <laughs> and, and, 
and I will point out all of those gems that I have read and reread and just think the world of because they make me think. And some of them are all about who are we when we try to help somebody else. We can't be presumptuous, we can't be filled with pride, we have to be humble, and we have to be very, very careful to protect our relationships. What does that mean? That means no man, no man has any business being alone with a woman in a counseling situation in the church. Now, you may take that chance and be fine. You may take that chance and it's a temptation you're not ready to withstand, even though you can, you're not ready to. Follow up, Glenn? Um, yeah, I think uh, I really appreciate Hold it, put like, your mic up. I like you, I really appreciate Dr. Wheat's uh, biblical foundation for much of his uh, recommendations and his communication key to your marriage regardless of how old it is. Yeah. And it is old. Yeah. And the illustrations are old. But still the advice is timeless. And that's that's the key is there's there are a few things that I think that couples can start out with that, that they would find to be helpful no matter who it is. And that's one of those gems as well. But, so Dr. Ed Wheat has always been part of my library since I started putting books together on the family. In more recent years, anything by the Penners um, on intimacy, they've written a dozen books or more. Anything by them is very highly recommended. And uh, uh, I found out at young people's meetings many, many years ago, I, I found out why the young, uh, when the young people stayed at our house, they always wanted to stay in my library. It's because that's where, that's where those books were. <laughs> He said, oh, you had the best books. He's like, uh, commentaries? No. <laughs> but yes, Dr. Ed Wheat, that book has been around forever. Um, and there's, a, there's quite a few other authors, but the most recent one is by the Penners and, and what they have done and the care uh, and the respect that they put into their advice is absolutely amazing. And it has helped many, many individuals. Finally, the love of your life is Neil Warren. Yes, thank you. Brother Jonathan Edwards from Avenue. I have a comment and a question, and I'd like your thoughts on both. I'm definitely at the beginning side of this, what you're doing. But what I've observed in a lot of the couples that we've studied with before marriage is that many of them are coming from families of divorce. And uh, Anecdotally, we did a love and respect study with three couples, and out of the eight present, only two of us came from a family where mom and dad were still together. And so, uh, I, I guess I'm seeing a lot of, of people who are going into marriage that did not have either a father or a mother figure fulfill that role all the way through for them. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, a lot of, of our work is about training men to be men and women to be women mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of times it's like there's a Christian woman and a, and a man who is also a Christian but uh, he has no confidence in his ability to lead a home none mm -hmm. or uh, a woman feels like a fraud managing a home because she's not known any way what that's like and so I'm curious if maybe want to comment on uh, how we can help a generation, maybe maybe it's uh, first generation Christians, if you want to call them that, people coming into the church from divorce or people in the church raised with divorce, etc. But it's as though we've kind of uh, glossed over the fact that they've missed out on a whole lot and we're just expecting them to get it right. I mean, and then my question is, if you have time, I heard you say a lot of uh, you or the preacher, etc., meaning only the male or only the man leading this type of study. Uh, do you not do studies where your wife joins you, or uh, do you not recommend that? That's, that's what I do. Marissa adds so much to the studies that uh, I participate in, and so this is just different from what I've heard, and I want to get your comments on that. Okay. So, um, 
children of divorce have been through a lot. I don't care how amicable the divorce was. Children of divorce have been through a lot. And children where parents were not divorced but were miserable human beings are likewise flawed in what a relationship should be. So as little kids, as little people, we learn how women treat men and men treat women by observing our parents. That's where it starts. When someone is missing, we still learn. And so leaders in congregations sometimes are the father figure for a family where there is no father. And there are some situations where the ladies in a congregation are the mother figure in a family where there is no mother. So we all look to mother and father figures, whether they are birth parents or step parents, foster parents, etc. Whenever someone has been, whenever their, their parents have been divorced, what I attempt to do is say, let's talk about what life was like for you, and let's understand that your home does not have to repeat this pattern. And in the workbook I use, and this would be true of any workbook or any set of questions that you want to go through with someone, there will be areas, and, I, and if it was just me, if, if my parents had been divorced and I was talking to me, I'd say, now Greg, there's going to be areas in our workbook where I'm going to say, Greg, you probably don't know what a home can be like because your parents were divorced. Now that's not true in every area, but I need to know where I don't know. And just because our parents are divorced doesn't mean we don't know anything, but it does mean we don't know how a family can survive fighting and can survive disagreement. And the first thing we do as little people when our parents divorce is to blame ourselves. So if you're dealing with someone whose parents divorced, understand they have carried a load of guilt every day since they have memory of that. And until you can help them with their load of guilt, they won't be ready to progress and learn in their relationship. So our minds are amazing memory vessels with a poor sense of timing. We, we remember so much and we, we soak up so many things. And then when we get married, we say, I am never gonna be like my parents, they got divorced. Or, I hated this about my mom. Or, I hated this about my dad. I'm never gonna be like my dad. I'm never gonna be like my mom until a situation occurs, whether or not there was divorce. And then we turn into the most amazing tape recorder and all we do is push play and we are our mother or we are our father and we give the speech and then we stop and think what have I done? I have just hurt my own relationship like my parents hurt theirs. So in dealing with people of divorce what I tell people I work with is look we're going to talk about anything we're going to talk about everything. You, sometimes I know the parents, sometimes I don't. You love your parents, I love your parents. Doesn't mean they don't have warts. So we're going to talk about warts, even on people we love, because we have to talk about where you might have problems in your relationship. And when a couple has divorced, it depends on the reason for the divorce. Were they divorced because the father was abusive? Were they divorced because one or the other was unfaithful? Were they divorced because they fought about money all the time? Well, why were they divorced? And that then flavors what you have to go through. Now, you ask about whether or not, because uh, I keep saying man, 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 preacher, 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 leader, 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 and that's what I prefer. So let's start there. That's what I prefer. Now, with that said, that doesn't mean that anyone's wife cannot be helpful in a situation. I do not see that that is a burden that a Christian woman should have. 
And here's what we end up having sometimes. If all we're going to do, and I'm not saying you do this at all, not, I'm not at all, but if all we end up doing is spending time with people, telling them the anecdotal stories of our own relationship, we're not helping them. They'll be able to say amazing things at our 50th anniversary party, but they won't have learned a thing about their own relationship. And so if I just tell everybody, hey, Cassie, fix breakfast. So? And whether I say that or Cassie says that, so? If you work a certain shift and your spouse works a certain shift, breakfast is the least thing you're concerned about. So it's just my preference because I see Christ leading the church and sacrificing himself for the church. And I see the wife being willing to let him lead. Now, at the same time, Priscilla and Aquila were a team. And they worked together in doctrinal areas. Priscilla had to act appropriately within her role, or that would not have been allowed, and it would not have worked. Aquila had to work appropriately within his role, or would not have been allowed, and it would not have been appropriate. It can be very complicated in a relationship when two counselors are attempting to help a couple because the couple are going to identify with one and they're going to play mom against dad. So that's my suggestion. I think you're better off doing it and at the most I would say to anyone doing that if you want to bring your wife in on a session to have something to say about a specific topic that you do that but that you lead the sessions. Now, with that said, older women are to teach younger women. When does that happen? But if the youngest woman in the congregation is the only woman that is going to talk to other women about relationships, that's not going to work well because she doesn't have life experiences enough to help. She can be sympathetic, she can learn all the secrets of that family, but it's not necessarily helpful. So that may not be what you want to hear, brother, um, and that may not be what everyone does, but I'm just saying we have to be really, really careful how we maintain our role relationships when we're trying to help others. Would you like him to follow up or oh. remarks? Oh my, well, you're so tolerant uh, and you're so nice because I've said some very hard things and I know that. Um, and I, I'm not as filtered as I used to be. <laughs> and so I would say I look out at all of our people in the Lord's Church, those who've been married forever and those who are just starting out and thinking about marriage, and we can do this. We can, we can be successful in this. And yes, we'll go through trials and tribulations, but we can do this. Now, what you've heard tonight are individuals in the audience who said, yeah, we help people, we do this. And what you've heard is that we don't all do it the same. But what, do, what is the common theme in all of this? We care. Everyone who's doing anything cares deeply about the church and about our homes and I think that's where we all have to be. We can disagree all day about exactly how to do this but in the end we care and we love. We love the Lord and we love the Lord's people and I trust that that's the motive for all of us in doing any of this.